Hi. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, let's get started. So, first of all, um, how many of you have used ChatGPT? All right. Very good. Um, how many of you know the project already? The MAS project from MOAS, MOAS Security? Very good. All right. Um, so we have asked at ChatGPT what's the best resource that uh, you can use to learn mobile security. So it this was the answer, the MASTG. So that was a very good answer. In other situations, I wouldn't recommend to trust the answers, but in this situation, uh, it's trustworthy. Um, another question I have, uh, how many of you have an Android phone? All right. So, do you know that you have the MASVS in your pocket already? Uh, so, Google has uh, founded this uh, association, the App Defense Alliance. And so, now you can see in the Google Play, when you want to download an app, if this, it has this badge, it means that it was validated using the OWASP MASVS. So, actually, you can kind of click and you will get to a page that explains all of this, and you will see that uh, it was tested like that. So what, what you can see here is like their process. Um, they base the testing on the MASVS, actually a subset of this, that later we will be calling that a profile. Just keep this word on your mind. And the testing is based on the MASDG, which is a testing guide. And then we uh, they have some set of authorized labs that uh, can perform these tests. So um, if they succeed, then their app will get this this patch. So users know that the app is secured according to MASVS. Um, then how many of you uh, work on security? Very good. So this is the right audience, uh, Sven. <laughs> All right, so this is us. Uh, I'm Carlos Olguera, I work for Now Secure and uh, I'm the co-leader with Sven of the MAS project. And well, you can find me on Twitter and other platforms, but yeah. Sven, Perfect. this is Sven. So just present yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my name is Sven. I'm also with Carlos, I'm being one of the project leads, already with the project since 2016 when we started it. And happy to present today about the latest updates that we have. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Cool. So, we'll watch on YouTube later. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yes. Okay. So, we could see already a few hands earlier. So, a few of you already know about the project, but just that we're all on the same page, let me just give you a quick recap of um, what the project is actually all about. So, I was saying it already in 2016, we were starting the project and we were very ambitious back then because we really wanted to define. Um, the industry standard for mobile app security. And we've come a long way, but I think we definitely achieved it also in the last few years because we got recognized at quite a few different countries. It's becoming part of quite different standards in the European Union, in different countries all over the world. But basically, the main deliverables of the project, of the MAS, the Mobile Application Security Projects, are the two things that you see here in the middle. So on the left side, it's the MASVS, which is a set of requirements that are specifically for mobile applications. And on the right side, you see the MASDG, which is outlining those requirements into very detailed um, specific test cases for iOS and also for Android. On the very left side, you see um, a checklist. So this is just an Excel checklist that with the help of Carlos, we automatically generate now um, with some Python foo. This checklist um, completely automated. So this means um, it's mapping the requirements to the specific test cases in the MASTG. So you have one requirement and then always two test cases, one for iOS and one for Android. On the very right side, you see this funny little icon. So this is um, the crack me's that we have also created over time. So with crack me's, we just mean that these are different iOS and also Android apps where you can just show off your skills that you already have, or maybe you just start with your reverse engineering um, career or just want to make a deep dive into this. So the crack me's will definitely help you for this. 
So we have specific iOS and also Android apps and also write-ups to it. So if you're completely new to it, you can just follow these um, write-ups and explore the reverse engineering process for iOS and also Android apps by yourself. Then next slide. So the next is now the MASVS. So I was saying it already, this is really the industry standard now for uh, mobile application security. So it summarizes dozens of different requirements that are specific to mobile apps. And this is really to ensure consistency in terms of testing for penetration testers and um, also for developers to just be aware of everything that could go wrong and what kind of vulnerabilities there might be. So we have now these seven different categories that you can see here. So we have storage, crypto, authentication, network, platform, code, and resiliency. So for example, platform is something that apps are, of course, talking to each other. Apps are talking to the operating system, different APIs. There's, of course, a lot of communication ongoing and a lot of things that can go wrong. Resiliency is covering everything um, that would make the life of a reverse engineer harder. So this is your jailbreak detection, anti-debugging, checks against any kind of hooking frameworks like Frida, if you are aware of this already. So this would be all covered um, in this category itself. And um, the MASTG now on the other side is now really a very, very thick book. So if you want to see it, so this would be the printed version of it. So if you still remember old phone books, this is actually the size of it. So this really covers in great detail what you should know. So it's definitely not a book that you might want to read end, uh, beginning to end. This might not be very enjoyable. But if you have a very specific problem, when you do a mobile application pen test, like for example, how do I test SSL pinning on Android, then you can just find the requirement. You will get all the, test, uh, the specific test case for it, and then you can just follow the steps that are actually included in it. So therefore, it's definitely a very good resource to... Um, fill the gaps that you might have so that you can follow all of these um, instructions that we're having. So this is an overview about what you can see or what there is actually on a high level in the MASTG. So we have something that we call a generic or general guidelines. So this means these are things that are applicable for iOS and Android. So if you think about network testing, this is of course not really something that is not applicable only for Android or only for iOS. Because at the end of the day, if you're testing something and it has only, I don't know, HTTP, for example, and is unencrypted, then this is applicable to both platforms, similar to cryptography and maybe also other things. But then we have very specific test cases, of course, for Android and also for iOS. And um, then we have also a tool section. So there are, of course, heaps of different tools. There are a lot of different open source tools. And we try to maintain and keep the ones that are really working, that are really maintained and um, really bring value also still to testing. So we have there a section where we explain what you can do with the tools obviously linked to the tools if there's already good documentation around it and how you can leverage and utilize the tools as part of the testing. On the right side, you can see then different kind of, um, uh, sorry, the, the security testing, crypto testing, all these kind of different test cases that we have. And of course, the different um, functions as part of the test cases. So you might do specific method hooking with things like Frida, maybe reverse engineering. So all of these things will be packaged um, into the MASTG. And the base is, of course, all the different tooling that you might be utilizing for it. Yes. So here the MAS website, um, mas.overs.org, you can see there's everything available. So everything is available as Markdown in GitHub. So we have a GitHub repo where this whole book is actually available as a Markdown file. And here it's just automatically parsed. So whenever we do a change, um, a new pull request, and it's ending up in our repo, then of course you can just see the latest changes um, available on the mas.overs.org website. So there's the um, MASVS, the MASTG, the checklist, and of course various different organizations that are applying this already, and everything can be found on this page here. Um, yeah. Yeah, anyway, to my right. there, right? I this also one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, here, uh, of course, you don't have to read the book in paper if you don't want to. Uh, we also don't actually recommend it because uh, tomorrow it will be outdated already. We are continuously uh, improving it. Uh, so we definitely... Oh, I don't have internet. All right. 
Uh, anyway, what I wanted to mention is here we have a nice search provided by our website and you can just uh, search for anything that you like. Like uh, is what Sven was saying that <clears throat> you don't have to read it from the beginning to the end, but just search whatever you're interested in, secure storage or key store, keychain, whatever, and you will find uh, the relevant information. So, uh, going back to your presentation. Yeah, so uh, the MASVS, in the last uh, couple of months, I guess more than a year already, we have been refactoring the MASVS. So, uh, the MASVS controls were very extensive, so we have really a lot, lot, lot of them. Imagine one of the categories could have from 5 to 15 controls, and in many cases they were very specific or verbose even. So we have been fixing all of these things and searching for uh, consistency and simplicity so that uh, it can be easily understandable by everyone, we hope. So um, part of that was uh, included removing some of the categories, like for instance, the, the first one, architecture. Uh, we will explain why. We have to remove that and uh, to the others we will be covering a couple of them so that you can see how the controls have changed and why, how the new controls look like. Um, there's one important thing that we have made. This is a legacy thing that we had and it's the IDs. So before, like right, the, the current version, all the MASVS IDs, they are MSTG storage. We don't know why. You know why? No, like nobody knows. Uh, <laughs> but we had to keep them because it's a standard, right? So, but now since we are breaking with uh, all the standard rules, never better said, um, we decided to fix this to have consistency. And if you knew the project already, you knew that it was called MSTG as well, and now it's MAS because it represents Mobile Application Security, which is the project, uh, what the project is about. So we also took the chance to fix the name of the document from MSTG to MASTG. So everything is MAS now and makes sense, hopefully. So um, this is one example from MASVS storage. Um, we had 15 requirements. Uh, I avoided putting all the text there. There are some keywords so you know they were about backups, logs, etc. So uh, these are the things that we did, like, well, only four of them. Just taking a look at them, trying to see if they are consistent, if there are any overlaps between controls, between categories even. Um, so we could see that in storage. Uh, we already mentioned IPC, and that's inter-process uh, communication, app-to-app -app communication that actually happens over platform interactions, so that actually should belong in platform interaction. So we move these kind of things over there. Um, and other things, as I said before, some controls, they were really very long and we had to like cut them and make them more simple, more comprehensive. So taking all of this into account is, um, it turned out that we had to remove one category, which is the uh, architecture category. Uh, and as a disclaimer, we have to say, because we got a lot of questions, why did we remove this and why um, the MSTG doesn't have any tests for that. So since the beginning of this category, we had this text, this disclaimer. So usually many people don't actually read <laughs> what we have in these sections, but it's stating that uh, there are no technical cases for this. So there's nothing that we would include in the MSTG anyway. And um, there are actually better standards that cover for this kind of things, like how you architect your app. And one of them is this NIST standard, uh, which has these four categories. Uh, this, what you see here is kind of a soft mapping that some of the controls that we have or we had in the MESVS, how they are actually here. So we actually checked for this, but we noticed that uh, we didn't have only this, but this standard is much better because that's the goal. The goal of this standard is to cover for those things. And that wasn't the goal of our standard. Our, ours is just for mobile security. The same goes for OWASAM. So we would, 
and the MASTG we will recommend you to go to these standards because they cover these topics much better. If we want to cover these topics for mobile apps, it, it's not that different from any other applications. So we would end up reinventing the wheel, reinventing this standard. So it doesn't make sense. That's why we will remove it and we will link to the standards and write some nice chapter on how you can apply things from the standards to the mobile apps. Storage. That's the next one. Yes. This was you. Yeah. Is it? Okay. <clears throat> so look at the microphone. Yes. So storage, as you could see earlier, so there were roughly 15 different requirements. And at the end of the day, we broke it down to basically two. So this means some of them were just moved into other categories, because when we were refactoring, we realized that some of them are actually not really storage. They should actually be covered in other categories. And these two, so the first one, MASVS storage one, the app securely stores sensitive data. So it's a short and sweet requirement, not as complex and lengthy as the earlier requirements that we had. And for this one, you can think about um, where's the data actually stored. So if you stay with the Android world, there might be internal storage, there might be external storage, and all of this will then be, of course, different kind of test cases. So you see the requirement on top, and then the test cases um, basically below. So in the old MASVS um, structure, we had always one requirement and one test case mapped to this requirement, where now, after we are done the refactoring in the MASVS, we are aiming that in the MASTG, we have several different test cases that might be part of one requirement, just to break down the test cases into much smaller different pieces, also with the goal of having more further automation, for example, because the bigger test case, obviously, the more complex it is, and this is what we want uh, to avoid, of course. So we have one thing of how the app is, if the app is securely storing data, the other requirement is more about if there's any kind of leakage of the data. And leakage can, of course, also be happening in various ways. So think about log files that might be created in a mobile app. There might be sensitive data. There might be other kind of data that might be exposed in log files. Um, even third parties, I mean, there's, of course, a lot of SDKs and other things that apps are heavily utilizing because we just rely heavily on third-party code anyway. But what is this SDK actually doing? Is it, for example, sending and leaking any data to another API, for example? So these are all different kind of things that, of course, need to be investigated and we need to be aware of. And um, also UI, is there any kind of sensitive data exposed in the user interface itself or also in backups? So there are quite a lot of different test cases that we can think of just in terms of leakage of data. So if we go on to the next slide. Yeah, one, one, one comment maybe. Okay. This is not the full list of tests. This is just repre <laughs> visual representation of the topics that we will be covering in the tests. But you can imagine maybe storage one will have 50 tests. We don't know yet. We are constructing those tests, but uh, nothing is gone. So if you know already our controls, nothing is gone. We just shifted it to the proper place. It might be another category or it might be a proper test in the MSTG. Exactly. So the previous um, storage test case that we had at the moment is very, very lengthy. Therefore, we just try to break it down into multiple test cases to make it easier to consume. The next thing is crypto. So very similar to um, what Carlos was already also explaining with OpenSAM. So we try to really utilize whatever is already out there. For example, with cryptography, we might just be more aligned with NIST and these kind of standards, for example, because they, of course, explain already very well things like key management and um, the key usage and in general just how keys should be treated also what kind of um, encryption functions might be deprecated and so on so therefore we heavily rely and also align with these kind of existing standards instead of again reinventing the wheel because cryptography is of course not just something in mobile apps it's of course much bigger than that and therefore it just makes sense to align to these kind of existing standards already so if you break it now down into um, two different um, uh, controls that you can see here. So this is again just samples of different kind of test cases that there might be in the future. So we have Crypto One. The app employs current strong cryptography and uses it according to industry best practices. So this might be test cases like is um, there an insecure random number generator? Is there any kind of custom crypto, for example, applied, which obviously you should avoid? 
and all these kind of things. And on the other side, for example, how the key management is actually handled. Are there any kind of hard-coded keys? Where is the key actually stored? On the Android worlds, do you, do you rely on the key chain? Or is there anything else that you are using which is not according to best practice? So all these kind of things will then be covered in specific test cases in the crypto chapter. Ah, yeah, authentication. So that's an interesting topic because initially, when you go to the next slide, yes. So I'm, I'm not sure if it was uh, Carlos or Hirun, but somebody pointed out back then that um, we have the keyword endpoint quite often, which you can see here as the red um, um, strings here or the, the red color here. So we had the um, keyword endpoint quite often in our requirements. So we had 12 requirements in this authentication category but we are supposed to be the mobile standard, so actually on the client side, right? But these are all things that are actually on the server side happening. So again, we didn't really have a clear differentiation between the client side and also the server side. And as with OWASP SAM, which is also a great project, the same thing applies to the ASVS, to the OWASP ASVS, where we just want to focus and simply rely on the great things that have already been done there so that we have a clear separation, of course, what is on the client side on the mobile app and what is specific to the mobile app and what is just considered um, on the um, server side itself so that we're just referencing to this instead of now defining our own requirements again, which would anyway only be a subset of the ASVS. So here you can see some examples and the auth1 and auth3 will be exactly these kind of references to the ASVS. But um, for mobile apps, of course, there's one difference because we have local authentication, which I guess everybody of you has anywhere used today. And if an iOS device, most likely using FaceTime, any, uh, not FaceTime, Face uh, uh, ID, um, just all the time to authenticate. And um, so this means we have biometrics, for example, which is, which is a test case. And of course, various other test cases that are part of this authentication chapter. And yeah. Then over to, go to <clears throat> MSTG refactoring. So, as I mentioned before, these were some of the topics. So, uh, what we are going to do with the MSTG is, with this book, is we will go through all of the chapters and all of the tests. And um, right now, if you read a test, uh, it might be really this long. So we will be splitting it in smaller chunks and we will be changing the structure. Like right now we have overview, static analysis, dynamic analysis. Um, how many of you know that CW is NIST? Okay. So uh, it's pretty much used in the security community for uh, the, uh, enumerating the weaknesses and they have a structure that is already well known. Like it's nothing special. It's something like yeah, have a summary, a description, a mitigation, examples, uh, references, etc. So we will be doing something similar to that, um, mirroring a bit this structure. And uh, you can imagine something like what I was mentioning now, our sections, and then we will have something like that so that we will ensure that each of the tests uh, have these uh, new structures. And uh, the most important part is that they will be very, very specific uh, as they are not today. They are very useful still today, but they are not specific like you could um, try to maybe parse them and try to automate them and document them automatically. So this will be possible uh, with a new version. Uh, this is another view of that, like just seeing, okay, we had a very big test and even it was covering two requirements and now the new tests uh, will be much smaller, much focused on, on certain topics uh, for each of the new controls. And uh, we call this atomic tests for obvious reasons. Um, and we will have very, very big collections of those tests which we will be categorizing according to what you already know you might have wondered maybe if you know the standard that we had several verification levels, L1, L2, uh, R. So, um, and they didn't appear in the slides until now. So that has the reason that we were, we are shifting those levels to the MASTG because we consider that if you need to test for, uh, something specific, um, 
you will need a really big list of tests from these uh, smaller chunks. So we can get more fine grained. Like imagine um, we and we can create new of these levels. Now we call them profiles. That's the next uh, topic I'm going to talk about: compliance as code. Um, with these new profiles, we can create new things. Like imagine you want to test just for privacy. So we could mark certain atomic tests. This is relevant for privacy. So you go to our website, you click privacy, and you get the list of tests which are relevant for privacy, for instance. And uh, with the complaints as code, uh, so you might know other standards, you might know our standards. So normally you get to have um, PDF, a Word, Excel files, so something that you kind of, you need a human to deal with it. And um, th that's hard. So, and we acknowledge that and we want to change that in the future. So we want to make everything machine readable so that you might have some tools that might want to read the information. Uh, make sure that you are covering for all the tests that we offer in the MSDG or the ones that are relevant to the profiles that your app uh, requires. Um, we will offer more things like uh, traceability, like we will be referring to the exact Git commits that we are using, uh, the versions, the dates, so you have all the information and you can read it automatically. <clears throat> then going to the, the profile. So this is an early concept of the profiles that we will be offering. So we are turning our traditional L1 and L2 into an L1 and L2 profiles, but we will be revisiting them. Um, so they should have a thread model behind and we will make that clear. Like today it's not very explicit in the MASVS. So it might be sometimes a bit, uh, <coughs> subjective. So we want to remove need of interpretation. We will be very explicit. So you know, uh, how these profiles were made and you will be able to recognize if a test should become one and um, belong to one profile or the other. And as I said before, also, we might uh, introduce new profiles, like imagine hardening. This means you don't have to do these things, but maybe you have an app that is really critical. So you might want to do hardening stuff that other apps that it doesn't need. This goes beyond L2. This is something like if you store the keys in, um, in the key store, that's fine. They might be protected by the TEE. That's fine. That might be actually L2 if you're unsure for that. But you can actually have a strong box. It's the highest protection available on Android. So that would be a hardening measure. If you don't have it, you we wouldn't say that your app is vulnerable. But for your threat model, it will be vulnerable. So you should apply in that case uh, things from the hardening uh, profile. Uh, the same would go, for instance, probably for certificate pinning. Not every app needed and not every app would be considered vulnerable if it doesn't have pinning, but in your, as part of your threat model, you might need certificate pinning. So that would be also part of this H uh, hardening. Resilience uh, stays the same. It's the same story. You don't need it always. Your app is not vulnerable if it doesn't have it. But if your threat model and the things you need to protect from your app, like your own IP um, or other things require that, then you would have to apply this, this profile as well. And I think the last one is, uh, is very interesting, which is privacy. So today very relevant. And if you were in the keynote, uh, the very first one, uh, a really nice one, uh, she was addressing this, this topic. So. We also would like to touch on this, so we will be suggesting some, uh, maybe a new MASVS category, maybe a separate document, we don't know yet, but we would like to try something out and uh, we will address that in the MASTG, so you have some tests, like we will try to analyze what is testable from privacy um, for the apps, so we will include it and release it and get your feedback, so. The good thing about this, the good thing about the, the profiles is that you can buy, you can combine them. So they will be machine readable and we will be following a NIST standard, which is called uh, OSCAL. 
and uh, this standard offers exactly these features. So imagine that uh, we will convince the ASVS also to follow this. We could combine the authentication um, part of the MASVS with the ASVS together, so you get a list of everything that you need to, to consider. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, Google and the uh, Google Play, they are testing for a subset so they can create their own profiles. And you can also think of banking apps having more requirements than the ones of the MASVS or health apps. So we give uh, a framework for other uh, for companies and institutions to build upon the uh, MASVS, which is anyway a baseline. <coughs> so next steps. Yes, so in terms of next steps, if you look at this, so um, on the very left side, this is our old MASVS. So we closed now the MASVS release candidate and also collected some feedback. And basically, we have now the MASVS version 2.0 in terms of the requirements that we are defining or that ha we have been defining. And um, what is happening now is the MASTG refactoring. So what Carlos was just mentioning to you in terms of atomic test cases, profile and compliance as code. This is basically the backlog for this year for the project in order to work on this and whatever we have now in the MASVS to really put this into action and refactor therefore the MASTG. And yes, so for this, of course, um, we need help. So we definitely have our core team. And to this also, um, thanks to, and uh, thank you to Hirun. Hirun Beckers, he is also one of the core engines of the project and is giving a lot of great um, support for the project. But if you also want to contribute, we have a specific page on mas.ovasp.org, which uh, is just summarizing how you can help and what the guidelines are just to get people up to speed of how they could contribute. And we also have a similar thing in terms of so-called advocates. And to this also, uh, thank you very much to Brian, who's also here today and now secure, who's our very first MAS advocate because they're supporting really significantly in terms of contributions and time. And this is, um, of course, very much needed uh, for such a project because as you could see, a phone book to refactor all the content is actually quite a bit of effort. And um, not only in terms of knowledge, but just in terms of time that is needed. And there's only so much um, that a few people can do. So if there's, if you're interested in it, definitely reach out to us. Um, you can reach out through, reach out to us via Slack and other channels, and we'll definitely be very helpful for any help. Yes. And this brings us to the end of our presentation. As I was saying, we are available via Twitter, um, Slack, and of course other channels. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Do you have any questions from the audience at this point? Okay, so. Uh, App Defense Alliance thing was new to me. And, uh, congratulations. Now, now we have OWASP in Android, which is great. And I can see it's an interesting initiative. But that was what I was doing. You've probably seen me you know, digging in my phone. I was going through Google Play apps. It's like, which apps have it? And I've checked every single banking app. Right. I checked all the UK banks. I've checked Bank of Ireland. None of them have that badge, but all the Google apps, you no know, Gmail, Google Docs, Google Drive, they all have it. So the question is, how do organizations can get that certification to get the, uh, uh, the badge of app defense in the apps? Do you wonder? They, um, so you saw in the slide, there are uh, authorized labs. Like, for instance, one of them is now secure. So you can request uh, one of these uh, pen tests. Um, I don't recall what is the cost, but you can do that. And, and then you will get uh, your app validated and then you will get the badge. Like there is a form, you, you put it, it's everything explained in the uh, App Defense Alliance uh, site. So you just enter, read the information and you provide the information that they need in this form and then yeah, one of these labs will do the pen test for you, and then you will get the the batch. I think it's also a mixed approach in terms of automated tooling and manual testing. Yeah. Before. Okay. Um, do, do you know, are you already in discussions, or is 
Apple already in discussions with you to provide something similar? No. <laughs> Short answer. Say again. Uh, Apple is just being Apple oh. and is a black box. Yeah. So no, I mean we 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 we, uh, we were trying to get in touch, but um, there was no follow up. Well, uh, that was some years ago, right? To be fair, that was a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, our hope is that um, Apple will see this, and then maybe they will be a, uh, open to collaboration, uh, seeing that Google already relies on us and uh, some governments will also start relying on us. That might push them a little bit. So <coughs> that's our hope. We will try it out again. Yep, definitely. Let's see. So just one question for me. Could you could you just pick up the phone book manual again, please? Did, <laughs> did, did you actually check that into the whole luggage? Did you bring it with you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Extra baggage. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Over there. Sorry, I'll just go to the front. Thank you. Uh, so, because at the beginning you mentioned that OWASP crack me. So I, I tried the iOS one um, a few weeks ago and I noticed it was all written in Objective C. So I was, which is quite old uh, and not really what we're currently using. I was just wondering if there's any drive to update it and move it towards Swift UI or if possibly oh. I'm looking at the wrong repo. And it's just an older one. It didn't seem to have been updated for a lot of years. <laughs> That's true. So there's definitely an Objective C. So we are also experimenting with ChatGPT if this can be automated. <laughs> but but otherwise, there's also a call for volunteers. I mean, this is also um, how how we started back then to do some Android apps and also iOS apps. Um, at the moment, I think this is not on on our backlog at the moment because we're focusing on the refactoring. But um, if people I mean, usually when people are volunteering, they play around with code and then maybe new apps might also be happening as, as a side uh, project, for example. But this is not um, the main agenda for us at the moment, to be honest. But I think we're also listing other different vulnerable apps. And I think there is definitely also a few Swift apps. So we have also one section where we just list down all different kind of Android and iOS apps that are out there. So the crack me is, you're right, they're definitely also a bit older. But that was also recently one new Android app, I think, right? Yeah, but uh, well, one thing I wanted to mention uh, regarding that is that <clears throat> uh, if you read the MSTG, you might notice that we have many code snippets as well. And um, to be honest, today we cannot know if they are still valid. If you put them in an app, they will work. There's no way to possibly know that unless you try it manually. Um, so we want to fix that. And that is um, following this approach of the atomic test and having these structures, uh, we want to have new code snippets and automation. Like we are using a lot now um, GitHub and the pipelines, etc. So um, we are experimenting with that. And this could look like, imagine you write one of these tests, you write your script, and then our pipeline will take that, pack it in an app, test the app, so that we know continuously that snippet is still good. And those snippets, vulnerable snippets, one crazy idea is let's take them, randomize them, put it in apps, and create new crack -mies. So they will be then actual current uh, in the next few years. So this might take time. We will need a lot of help. Please. And <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that's the idea. We think, uh, we think that will be fun, actually. So, okay. let's see. Um, it's more, yeah, so with data storage on mobile devices in the, uh, in the guide, it has that you can store with the hardware security modules and using like the keychain and the key store. I've tested apps and I've noticed that a lot of pin codes seem to be stored on the device. So if you disconnect from the internet, uh, enter your pin, you can still get in. So I'm assuming that they're stored in the like secure enclave or they're stored with the uh, key store. Given that if you jailbreak a device, you can dump the keychain, do you think it's sufficient to store uh, essentially an access token there? <laughs> I mean, I, so so basically the question is if it's sufficient if you just do this locally. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I guess this highly depends then on the use case also, right? Because there might be specific use cases where you actually want to have a lot of data maybe on the device. If you think about, I don't know, insurance, medical apps, maybe where we have devices, maybe with somebody, and it should just function regardless if there's no internet or not. Because the business case is that you need to have access to this data, otherwise you might be losing a client or a patient. And then um, this, this might then be maybe something where the the use case might be like this, that maybe the security might not be as high. So that there might be specific use cases for this, but you're right. In general, of course, everything should be handled on the server side. The data should be handled on the server side because at the end of the day, it's just a client that should maybe send some uh, token to the server, to the backend, and then you should be able to access the data. But there might be other use cases and other threat models, I guess. Yeah, it's also when, I guess, we enter the field of privacy, uh which we would like to start touching on so uh i guess you will start finding some answers to those questions in the mstg version 2 so we will hope uh for your feedback on that as well but yeah we okay. will try to address that and address that also via these profiles that we will be defining so okay i think we just have one more question if that's okay absolutely Okay. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Maybe not. Was there a final question? Okay. Uh, th thanks for the talk. Um, back of the Bank of Ireland, I think it was mentioned up there, yeah, their T's and C's for banking apps have been unbelievable for over a decade. <laughs> But we've seen European Union did put laws together for packing apps, specifically on mobiles. They got to check their own integrity. That's that's written out of the European law quite a long time ago. Is there any other laws in the books that you know of that are going to work on this as a best practice and say we mandate that this happens? Mm, and yes. supplementary question: Is that a job for an advocate? That's not in Europe, and like. Uh, we have in the website uh, currently NIST, which also relies on, on us, or well, that would be America. Uh, for Europe, to be honest, we have to still get in touch with them. So, but we will, we will try that out and see what we can, what we can do. But uh, currently we have, you can go here and I think now it will work. Let me just check. Well, you see also the, no. Uh, we have NIST and, and we have the German government, which also uh, produce uh, a standard for health apps uh, based on the MESVS. So, yeah, goes slowly, but it's it's working. <laughs> so let's see. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's great. Just a quick round of applause. Thanks very much. Thank you.